sing right there. Let's get our Bibles ready. I am happy all the day. Now, I want to say that I have not been happy all of the day in my Christian experience. Uh, if I'm in my flesh, but if I'm in the Holy Spirit and I'm focused on Jesus Christ, then I'm happy all the day. There's a difference there. Uh, in myself, I certainly can't be happy all the day, and that's not what the intent of the song is. It's at the cross, at the cross. And so I pray that that song was a blessing to you. And so uh, I, I do want to say that somebody has been up here on stage. I can tell. I think it's been Riel. He was in the tent. He was in here. <laughs> this has been moved. I can tell. As soon as I walked in, I was like, okay, somebody's been in the tent. I think it was Riel. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Rael, honestly. Anyways, let's get into God's Word. I want to go to Mark chapter 2. That's where we'll be this morning, beginning a, a brand new series. Let me tell you a story about camping. Uh, I was a camper when I was much younger, and then I became a youth pastor. And then uh, we did some campouts with teenagers. And how many people know that's a, just about as crazy as you can get? And so we took 100 teenagers many years ago tenting up in New Hampshire, and so uh, we had, wow, what a crew. I'm having PTSD even now <laughs> because it was, it was incredible on multiple levels. But anyway, we're camping in tents, and the ranger that was there at the camps, campground uh, said that there was word that Sasquatch was coming down off the mountain. Uh, bears, not Sasquatch, but bears were coming down off the mountain and we needed to make sure that uh, everything was taken care of as far as food and up off the ground, that kind of thing. And so anyway, that night, um, we all went to our tents, and I'm with the guys, and we have about six or seven guys per tent. Lisa's with the girls with a big team of adults, one adult per tent. Uh, I can't remember how many tents we must have had. Do the math on that. I won't do that real quick. But so anyway, in the middle of the night, uh, there's this tremendous scream by one of the girls in one of the tents. And so we're thinking Sasquatch, I mean, being eaten by a bear or something, you know, and uh, Lisa just flies up into the air, you know, and she's like, I got to go see what's going on. She goes to the door of the tent and she can't get out. And what somebody had done is put little padlocks on each and every one of our tents and locked us in as a practical joke. Well, that wasn't funny to my wife. So she took the tent door and just ripped it open. And she comes out of that tent like, I'm going to save my girls, you know. But it wasn't the Sasquatch or the bear. It was she had to go to the bathroom, and she was going to pee her pants if, uh, if she didn't get to the bathroom. And so that was the, the, the emergency. Camping can be uh, an amazing experience, positively or negatively. Uh, our world is, is spending lots of money on camping. In fact, Camping World, I don't know if you ever heard of that, that company camp. Think about that name. <laughs> I mean, this isn't just like Camping York. This isn't Camping Maine. This is Camping World. I mean, this is big. This is the whole world. You know, and in fact, the whole world in some form or fashion has probably camped at one time or another. Let me give you some statistics. $167 billion were spent on gear last year. 1.4 million jobs interrelated with the whole camping industry. 57 million households camped. Just curious, anybody camp here on a regular basis through the years? Raise your hand. Anybody camp? Oh, come on. I know. You guys say you have camp. You say you have cabins. I hear that a lot. I'm going up to the cabin. I'm thinking to myself, I need a cabin. If I'm going to be in Maine, I need a cabin. I feel so left out. Anyway, 64% prefer tents. Isn't that amazing? Wow. I mean, I'm thinking camping now at 57 and 56. What, like air mattresses, you know, Sealy posture. Let's bring the mattress with us. I'm not laying on the ground for anybody. Anyway, I want to go through, a, a, I want to go on a camping road trip with you, and I hope that you'll join me for this. It's going to be rather extensive. It's going to last all through the summer and into August, and I want to go to 20 incredible locations. Here's some of the ones I found online that were unbelievable. I mean, can you imagine camping in these locations? Uh, and just coming out of your tent, and there it is, God's creation. Uh, of course, the one on the top right is Grand Canyon. But uh, we, ha we are living in an area that is incredibly beautiful. And I'm new to this. I mean, I've vacationed here once in a while through the years. But I live here, and I live in paradise. Uh, and if you've been here a long, long time, then sometimes you kind of lose that, that vision 
of where you live. And so when I start talking about loving where I live, people look at me like, wow, that's good, wow. Maybe I should look at this with fresh eyes again. Because you do kind of lose that, you know, if you're here for long. You take it for granted. Can I just say to you, people come from all over to come here, right? And they want to camp here. And so we're going to talk about camping and going to 20 different locations. I want to show you these locations just really quickly. This is where we're going to travel to. We're going to go to the rooftop, the valley, the ocean, the pit, the river, the furnace, the prison, the city, the beach, the church, the foreign land, the battlefield, the mountain, the desert, the cave, the tomb, the island, the pool, the cross, and the garden. Not all today. That would be quite the camping trip. No, this is going to be one at a time, and we're going to travel to campsites, and we're going to see what God has for us as we camp in these locations. God is calling us to live an extraordinary life, not an ordinary life. He wants us to go to places with him that maybe we haven't gone before, much like going to a campsite you've never been, and when you get there, you come out, and you're like, wow, this is spectacular. This is beautiful. I never thought it could be so great. And this is what I want for our church. Is maybe you're, you've gone through some things. Maybe you're in the middle of something. Maybe your Christian life has, in some form, been kind of stale. Maybe it's been like, you know, I don't know, God, are you there? God, I, I don't know. I don't feel you. I don't experience you. I don't see you like I used to. And when you go to this campsite that we're going to go to, and there'll be 20 of them, you're going to come out of that going, wow, what a beautiful view of God. What a spectacular vision I have of the majesty of God. And you're just going to be changed forever. That's my prayer. Can we pray for that as we move through this camping road trip? Genesis 32, you'll see it on the screen, verses 1 and 2. If you read my God at Work newsletter every week, I had quoted this, Genesis 32, 1 and 2. Jacob went on his way, and the angels of God met him. And when Jacob saw them, he said, this is God's camp. This is God's camp. And so he called the name of that place Mahanaim, which would mean um, sanctuary or could mean place of refuge. Uh, it was the city that David went to when he was running from his son Absalom, when Absalom was trying to kill him. You see, a campsite that we're going to look at is a place that we're going to spend some time, but we're going to learn some things about God. And then we're going to find that he is a refuge for us, that he is the one that establishes our steps, that goes before us. He's also behind us, and he's to the side of us, and he's above us. He is omniscient, and he's ever-present in your life at all times. That was just for somebody watching online. I just got to check in my spirit for that. I don't know who that is, but you needed to hear that just now. I'm excited about this camping road trip. I hope that you are. Now, look with me here um, before I, I don't want to trip over my Yeti. You stay right there. But this is on purpose. This is on purpose. The cross has to be the center, right? Has to be in the middle of everything. Jesus. Every campsite that we're ever going to go to, it has to be about Jesus being there and manifest presence, of course, by his spirit, right? So keep Jesus the center of all of these campsites that we're going to go to. And man, you're going to come out the other side of that going, this is awesome. This is awesome. I will be using some of these props and these visuals throughout our time together to have spiritual truths, so it's just not for anything. I've titled this series, The Survival Guide to Christian Camping. The Survival Guide to Christian Camping. And so we do have some invitations. If you feel like you want to give these to people you might run into, then I would encourage you to do that. The Holy Spirit will say, give one of these to this person. That's what God will do. So take them. They're over there at the Welcome Center. And then pray over them and say, God, who do you want me to talk to about this? And who do you want me to encourage to be a part of this series? Because we have thousands and thousands of people coming through here. Can I just say to you, probably most of them don't know Jesus. And now's our opportunity to be able to reach out to them. The Survival Guide to Christian Camping. Let me just tell you a quick story. Uh, I was at market basket. I just feel like I need to share this with you. It may seem a little bit mystical to you. I don't know. Maybe you'll go, amen, hallelujah. I'll take a little bit of a risk right now. So I'm at the market basket, and anytime I go to market basket, I need to be in the spirit on that day. I'm telling you. That'll challenge my Christian life like no other experience. 
But anyway, I went inside to help my wonderful wife because she was tired and she needed some assistance, encouragement, coaching, carry some bags, all of that. So I'm in Market Basket, I'm at the fish counter and I'm ordering my fish and there's a lady next to me and she was on a, a scooter. And uh, she's a fairly young lady on a scooter. So I'm thinking, okay, what's going on here? She's a cute little daughter and her husband comes walking up to the counter and I just had a brief conversation with her. And so I move on and go down the aisles with Lisa and then the Holy Spirit starts going, okay, you gotta tell her something. Tell her it's going to be okay. I'm like, I don't know how she's going to receive that. And so I, through the aisle after aisle, it's building inside of me. Now I'm at the checkout, and Lisa's talking to the, the, the people working there and putting stuff in the bags, and I'm helping that out. And I said, Lisa, I'll be back. i got to go find her. And so I said to the Lord, if I find her, then I'm going to believe that you want me to say this to her. And so I'm walking down towards the produce to her in the aisle. There she is with her daughter and her husband, and I walk up to her, and I say, I don't know, this may sound kind of strange to you, but I just want to tell you what I believe the Lord wants me to tell you, and that it's going to be okay. And she just looks up at me, and she says, thank you, and her husband said, what did he say? And I said, the Lord wanted me to tell you it's going to be okay, and then I left. The Holy Spirit of God wants to do things that will blow our mind. That'll cause us to go, God, you're in the middle of this. Now, I never thought that Market Basket would be a campsite. Okay, you know I'm going with this campsite thing, right? There are places that God has for us to go so that we experience him in all his fullness. And I left Market Basket with a good experience. Now, I want to go back to Market Basket. It's not like a stronghold to me anymore. I'm like, I'll go in there. Yeah. It just gets to be thrilling. The survival guide of Christian camping. Imagine these living on these rooftops here, if you could bring those up. Can you imagine that? We're talking about some incredible places and spaces. So now you know where we're traveling on our first campsite, right? I call this the rooftop. Mark chapter 2, the rooftop. This is campsite number one. We're all going to be on rooftops at various times in our Christian life. I want to look at this text, Mark 2, 1 to 12. And in our text, we're going to see how these people experience camping on a rooftop. I'm going to read it out loud if you'll follow along by watching with your own eyes on the text. And when he, when he returned to Capernaum after some days, it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And he was preaching the word to them, and they came bringing to him a paralytic carried by four men. And when they could not get near him because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him. And when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, Son, your sins are forgiven. Now some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? And immediately Jesus, perceiving his spirit or reading their minds, he is omniscient. He knows all things. This is a manifestation of the omniscience of Jesus Christ right here. This isn't because he looked at their countenance and read that. It wasn't psychology involved. It was because he knew men. He knew what was going on. That's what that means here. Why does this man speak like that? He is blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? So he's perceiving this, verse 9, which is easier, to say to the paralytic, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk. But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins, he said to the paralytic, I say to you, rise, pick up your bed, and go home. And he rose and immediately picked up his bed and went out before them all, so that they were all amazed and glorified God, saying, we never saw anything like this. I want to look at this text with you. From five vantage points. Here's number one. Write it in your outline there, the environment. Let's look at the environment in verses one and two. What is the setting? What is the context? If you want to understand certain verses, look at the setting or the environment, what's going on before or after. Look at the cultural context. I have books in my library that talk about all of these things, and I'll pull out tools and try to understand what's going on in the Jewish mind at the time. And It's important to understand where Mark is going as he's giving this account of these people that are on the rooftop and what they do. And so let me go through some of this with you as we look at number one, the environment. It says, and when. That's how it opens up. Now, the writers, or the, uh, the interpreters, not interpreters, let me get this right. Those who, who um, put chapters and verses in the Bible, because there was none in the original languages. So those people, 
decided that here would be a good break, and when. I don't want to get into all the reasons or ways that they come to those conclusions. That would just bog us down right now. But you'll see here, and when, and there is a break here. It's a very important break, and I want to talk about that. And when Jesus returned, it says, to Capernaum after some days. We don't know how many days. Some commentators or scholars would say maybe a month and a half later. Now, Jesus was traveling around Galilee, and we're going to see some of that. And he's doing ministry, and there's miracles happening. Then he returns back to Capernaum. Maybe a month and a half. Let's just put that number out there. That's the one I found the most as I did my research. Now, if you go back to chapter 1 and verse 21, take your eyes there. Jesus is going to Capernaum. See it there? Verse 21 of chapter 1. So he's going to Capernaum, and then from Capernaum he goes out, and he's doing ministry. It says in the text here, and I'm in chapter 1, immediately he enters a synagogue, which is his strategy, and that's what Jesus would do. He'd go into synagogues and teach, and he'd preach. But this is different. It says that they were astonished at what he taught. Now, there's a reason for that, because he was one who had, what does the word say? Authority, not as described. In other words, the unction of God, the conviction of God was on him. We would call that maybe the baptism of the Spirit. Depends what camp you land in. And so that is when the Spirit of God comes down on a man or a person as they share the gospel, as they share Jesus, as they preach the word of God. Jesus had an authority that when he spoke, it was different than the religious people. And you'll be able to tell a religious person from somebody that's spiritual. There's a difference there. Jesus is here teaching in the synagogue, and he has this authority not as religious people. And I would say to you, and I'm going to say this a long time, in how many years I'm with you, don't be a religious person. Be a spiritual person. Big difference there. You don't want to be like the scribes. They're not the good guys. Pharisees aren't the good guys. Sadducees aren't. It's people like Mary Magdalene who was delivered from seven demons. She's the good girl. She's the one that realizes she needs Jesus. She's the one that's not religious. She's the one that loves him and is devoted to him. There's a difference there. Scribes don't have the anointing. Mary Magdalene has the anointing. Do you want the anointing on your life? Watch out for religiosity. Anyway, notice it says immediately, and this is going down through the text here and the experiences that Jesus is having, after he went to Capernaum, it says that there was a demon-possessed man who cries out. Don't you know that when you have the unction of God on you, you have the, the presence of God surrounding you, you're preaching the word of God or sharing Jesus, living the Christian life, don't you know that there are going to be some demons that are going to be upset at you? You're saying, that's never happened to me. Watch what happens as God grows your life to places that you might not have ever experienced. Because it's quite possible that your Christian life has been such on a plateau that demons aren't even threatened by you. So they're not going to bother you. You'll have no idea what's going on. You'll be like, well, that stuff doesn't happen today. It happens to Jesus, and it happens to Paul, and it happens to the other apostles. I think it should be happening to us. Here's what happens to them. The demon cries out. Jesus rebukes him, it says here. I'm reading the text. Be silent, he says, and come out of him. And the demon throws the man into convulsions, and eventually comes out, and it says in verse 27 of chapter 1, they were all what? Amazed. Notice that. Verse 21, at once his fame, this is important, his fame spread everywhere throughout the surrounding regions of Galilee. And then again in verse 29, immediately, and you have these things that are happening, this unfolding of the ministry and miracles of Christ. But Jesus is becoming famous. There's a celebrity thing that is happening here to Christ the paparazzi are around, the reporters are there. He's delivering demons, chapter 1, verse 33, down to verse 39. From 40 to 45, a leper is healed. I mean, there's miracle after miracle, and the more miracles, the more celebrity he becomes, and it's a frenzy. So many people are gathering around. But here's what I want you to see, that Jesus had authority in his teaching, but he had authority also over demons. He also had authority over disease. And now we're going to see in our text, 
He has authority to forgive sins. And who can forgive sins but who? But God. And that's what gets the scribes, Pharisees upset, and the Sadducees, and that's why they crucify him. Because he's claiming to be God. Now that's the main point of our text. It's not going to be the guy being lowered in. It's not going to be the four, although there's application there. It's not going to be the others who are on that rooftop because there's probably more than just the four in the paralytic. It's Jesus being there at the center of it all. Remember the cross, the campsite, the rooftop. You're going to be on a rooftop someday, and you're going to have to know that Jesus is the Son of God. He calls himself the Son of Man. He does that for a reason. doesn't call himself the Son of God. What was he doing? He's probably saying something like this in his mind. I'm going to just lay low right here for a while. If he were to say Son of God, oh boy. He says Son of Man. And that's on purpose. So here's the environment. We're looking at that. It says that he was so popular, so, such an authority, or a celebrity, rather, that he has to go to desolate places. My version says desolate or rural places or out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, he's moving away from cities because the crowds are crushing in on him. You remember that the crowds were so great that at times when he preached, he had to get in a boat and go out into the water to be able to preach back to the crowd because there were so many that were coming upon him. Verse 1, now I'm back in our text in chapter 2 of Mark, it was reported that he was at home. So now after a month and a half, Jesus says, okay, the coast is clear. I'm going to go from all of these cities that I've been doing miracles, preaching in synagogues, I'm going to go back to Capernaum. And he's probably thinking it's, it's going to be a lot less crowded and it's going to be a lot quieter and I can go back into my house and... Uh, and hang out in my hometown, which is where his base of operations became, which was Capernaum. So he goes back, and you know who's there? Fox News and CNN, the paparazzi, and Peter Ducey's there, you know? And it's like crowds start coming into his house, and, and they're, they're, they're just packed in, every room in his house. Some say it was Peter and Andrew's house, uh, or there's a debate, but that's not any big deal. Could have been Peter and Andrew's house. They lived in Capernaum. But Jesus also lived there, so he might have had his own home. Whichever, the house, it was packed with people all the way to the door and even surrounding the door. Why were they there? Healings. That's why they were there. Primarily, they heard about his healings, and there were people that wanted to be healed, and so they came by the hundreds and even thousands. Curiosity, there were seekers. They were, they were just wanting to see who this guy was that was getting so much publicity and had become so famous. They were looking for handouts. There are people like that that look for handouts. And, but what would Jesus do? What does he do? What is the primary thing that we find him doing here? What do you think? It says it right there. He's preaching. He's preaching. It says he's preaching the word of God. Does that say something to, to me as a preacher? As far as prayer, I believe in prayer. I believe in all of these other things that a pastor would do or a Christian ought to do. But number one in Christ's mission is that he's going to open the word of God and preach the word of God or teach the word of God and explain the word of God. And that's just not for me. That's for you too. Now, you might not get behind a cooler or a pulpit, whatever you want to call it, but you will explain Jesus to other people. Make that a priority. All right, let me ask you a question. Have you ever been on a rooftop before? Right? Have you ever been on a rooftop? And so I remember as a kid, I would go up on the top of my house, and my house was rather tall. I had, it was tall to a young kid. I was just a little guy, and so I went up on the top of the roof just for kicks and giggles. I wanted to figure, see what it was all about, and it was something I'll never forget. I figured that uh, I'll graduate from that, and so I, I went to my elementary school, and I climbed up a drain pipe onto the roof of our school. And then the surrounding neighbors saw me over there and called the cops, and so I was like, you know, down the drain pipe and out. Never spent any time in the slammer. But I've been on some rooftops. Now, I've also been on some spiritual rooftops, and so have you. So have you. But there's more rooftops to come. You're going to have to camp out here. Here's the environment, number two, the extent. Verse three, look at the extent. What, what extent would you go to, to be near the one who could bring healing? Do you have somebody in your world, is it a son or daughter, is it someone that you know that you will go to great extent to bring them to Christ, bring them into the presence of God, bring them to the one who can heal their soul? Are they troubled in their mind? 
Are they going through things in their relationships and in their mind that is overwhelming to them, that's causing them to almost feel like they're ready to collapse? What extent will you go to as a Christian and what will we go to as a church to try to bring people into the presence of Jesus so that Jesus can do what only he can do? The people in our text go to great extent. It says in the verse 3 there, and they came. Let's stop there for a moment. And they came. Who's the they? Matthew says some in his account of this story. We know it's more than the four men, uh, probably some others on the rooftop there. With Luke doesn't even mention uh, this at all in his gospel. So in addition to the men caring, I think that there is probably some others on that rooftop, and they're going to have their own experiences. They watch what is about to happen. So they're at Peter. Let's go with Peter and Andrew's home. It must have been someone that the four men, the four men who are carrying, it must have been someone that was in relationship with the paralytic, I would imagine. I don't think the four men on that rooftop are just strangers. I think that they had known this man and probably watched this man for a long, long time and watched him walk in shame because if you were paralyzed, a lot of times there was judgment on your life, much like a leper. And so paralyzed people wouldn't go out in public very much. Lepers wouldn't go around crowds very much, because, not because the, the, the disease itself. It was more the stigma. It was the more the way people viewed them, and they just couldn't take it. And so this man is a paralyzed man and probably had heaped judgment. Other people have heaped judgment on him. And now he's, he's thinking to himself, I'm probably going to be like this all my life. And then these four say, no, 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 no. There's one who could heal you. There's one that we know that can touch your life. And we're willing to carry you. And there was no ambulances back then, no SUVs, you know, no minivan that you could put the seats down and put this guy in and drive there. How far did they come carrying this man? We're not really sure. I don't think it mattered to them. I think they would go to every extent to take this man into the presence of God because I really think they knew who he was. I don't think they just thought he was going to heal him because he was a healer or he's a great teacher. I really think that these people, because Jesus would later say, I saw their faith, I saw their faith. What, what kind of faith is that? The faith going into the roof or is it a saving faith? I believe it's a saving faith. Something was happening already in their life. So they probably came from quite a distance. What do you see here in the group that's on that rooftop? What do you see? I see strong desire. I see initiative. I definitely see faith. Jesus saw that. I see people who are relentless. They will go to whatever extent they need to go to to get this friend of theirs into the presence of Jesus. There's others there. They stay in the background. Now, imagine you being on the background. Now, when I was in college, I was the back row Baptist. I went to Liberty University. It was called Liberty Baptist College, but then it changed the year I was there to Liberty University. And I was a back row Baptist, so I would stay in the back always. Lisa would always go to the front. And she, we weren't dating at the time. But, and so when we started dating, she would say, come to the front, come to the front. And I eventually did. But I was a back row person. Think about the back row in this setting here. Who are they? Did they want to get as close as they could? Probably, but couldn't because they're being pushed out. And this, and this crowd is relentless. They don't care about each other. They don't. They're, they're not, hey, the guy's coming with four carrying him, and they say, hey, part the way. Part the way. Let this guy get in front of Jesus. They don't even do that because it's every man or every woman for themselves in this crowd. Think about that. It doesn't stop the four. And so there's some in the back, and I, I'm, I feel bad because um, if I would have stayed in the back um, during chapel, and, and eventually I would move up, but I found myself, and this isn't anything with you that sit in the back. I'm not asking you to come to the front row. I'm not, not saying that. Whew. Some people are wiping sweat off their brow. I'm just saying, the people here, I wonder if they just missed out on something. I think I would have missed out if I didn't press in more, you know, growing in the Lord, if I didn't come in, charge in, if I didn't take great extent in, in our Christian life, in my Christian life. So here, here, here's what they're doing here. It's an amazing story. I love this story. How far, how far would they go? Well, obviously, they went a long, long ways. And let's go to number three, the effort, verse four. It says here that when they get to this dwelling, Andrew, Peter, whoever, Jesus' house, they removed the tile. Luke says tile, not our text in Mark. They removed the roof above him. Now, now you got to think about this. Here's the crowd. 
here's the four, and they're approaching the house, and they, they know they're not going to be able to get close to him. So what do they do? Do they stay in the back and say, poor guy, I'm not going to be able to get him to Jesus? Is that what they do? They don't do that. Houses in that day had an outside staircase, and they would, it would lead up to the roof. And so how come nobody else thought about that? Think about this. you gotta, you got to want him. You've got to want Jesus like no other. This is going to separate the men from the boys. This is going to separate those Christians who are mediocre to those who are not. You've got to want him. You've got to be, want to be around him. You've got to want to love him. You've got to want to follow him. You've got to want to worship him. You've got to want to bow before him. You've got to want him with everything. This is what they are showing here. They would put any kind of effort into getting this man into the presence of Jesus. And some, most, did not even think about that. How many Christians sitting here, how many watching, how many will watch this message and you, you haven't put the effort into it. You didn't even think out of the box. Jesus is calling you to a rooftop and when you get to the rooftop and you experience what they experience, your Christianity will go to a whole nother place. But it's kind of tragic in this crowd that we're reading here. It's like, so if you're in the back row and you're watching this, you're going, where are those guys going with him? Wait a minute. Look, they're going up the stairs. How come I didn't think about that? What are they doing up there? Why are they grabbing those tools? What are they going to do with those tools? It's dramatic. It's so dramatic. And so they start removing the tile. Usually there's tile. It would be tile on the, the roof. We are, understand tile. I lived in Phoenix. There are tile roofs out there. And so they would go through the tile. Now, that's not an easy thing to do. And then under that would be some thatch and some mud, and then there were some sticks. And then that's not an easy thing to try to pull off. The amount of effort that they would put into this is enormous. It didn't matter to them. It didn't matter. Now remember this, it says in the text, it says that it was above Jesus that they started to come through. So not only are they going to dig through the roof and put all that effort into it, they have to find out where Jesus is located in the house. Think about that. Can you imagine boring a hole and he's not there? You're like in the lobby still. You're like in the foyer. Like, what? Who didn't do the research on that one, you know? So these four guys probably, one of, you know, I don't know who it was, we don't have any record of that in the text, are, are looking and trying to figure out exactly where he is so that they go through right where he's at. That's an important little feature right there. I think, I think in this scenario, this campsite, I see tenacity, I see perseverance, I see commitment to do whatever it takes to go through the roof. This was not an easy thing for them to do. The effort was enormous. Can you imagine going through this roof? Can you imagine if all of a sudden the tiles just start breaking? It looks like they already are. Look at that. But anyway, so it would be, you have to get up on the roof, which is very high, and you have to go through the tile. Then you go through the plywood. Then there's this ceiling, and you have to go through that ceiling. Can you imagine the effort? How do you get up there? Well, you would have to get maybe a scaffolding on the outside, or you can go through the staircase right through here, all the way up to the top, which I haven't been. People have encouraged me to go. I said, that's okay, I don't need to see it. I don't need to go up there. That would be an enormous amount of effort to come through this ceiling, this roof. I see strong belief. I see desperation. I see diligence. I see vigilance here. Here's number four. Let's look at the exclusivity. Verses five to eight, the exclusivity of Christ. As the hole in the roof is being made, and that's a big deal. The ceiling starts to collapse from the inside. As they're coming through, Jesus looks up, and the text says he saw their what? Their faith. Now, that's interesting. He's looking, and he's seeing their faith, and I really believe he's looking at York Street going, does this church really believe me? If this church believes God and has faith in God, I'm not talking intellectually. I'm not talking because a preacher said something to you some time ago, and you say, yeah, I have faith. No, I'm talking about experiential faith. I'm talking about living, thriving, vibrant faith. 
If you have that kind of faith, what could God do? It's unlimited. I think he's looking at our church and he's wanting to see faith here. Well, anyway, Jesus looks at him, sees their faith, and then he says this to him Your sins are forgiven. Now, that's interesting. Your sins are forgiven. Now, remember, he's walking in shame and he's walking in guilt. Why? Because he's paralyzed. That's part of it. I really believe that God was drawing him to himself so that he would become a Christian, that he would believe in Jesus Christ. I think he's looking at the faith that is a saving faith, meaning this guy has already been in process. And so he says to this man that's laying on his mat, your sins are forgiven you. Verse 6 says the scribes were also sitting there. Why were they there? Why were the scribes and the Pharisees there? Well, they're going to try to trap Jesus. That's why they're there. Try to catch him. And, and, and they're going to criticize him, and there's always going to be critics to the move of God and all of that, and critics in your life. And if you say that you're living for Jesus, walking with Jesus, you're going to have those people. You're going to have your own congregation. I've had people in my congregation that loved Jesus, walked with Jesus, went as far with Jesus as they could. And then there were others that were just critics. You know, and everything was negative, and everything wasn't going to work. And every, there's always going to be those two groups, and here you have it here. The sad thing is that they're the religious leaders. Shouldn't have been like that. Anyway, they're sitting there, the text says. What was so wrong about what Jesus said? Well, the text says that they were questioning in their hearts. Verse 7, why, why does this man speak like that, they say? He is doing what? What's it say? Blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone, he says. Now, they're right theologically because no one can forgive sins other than God. So they're right and they're wrong. On another note, verse 8 says, immediately Jesus reads their mind. He reads their heart. Again, he's omniscient. He's moving and operating in this uh, attribute that only God has. He is omniscient and knows everything. And anyway, he's getting this read on where they're really coming from. But what we want to look at here is the exclusivity of Christ. And so what Jesus is saying, and really to the point, is I'm God. I'm God. And whoa, that made them upset. I love that about him, Jesus. I love that. He knew who he was, what he was sent for. Do we? Do we know who we are in Christ and why we're sent here? Jesus is exclusive. He is the one who was crucified. He's the one that was lifted high on a cross, and we looked at that on Easter. He's the one that died and was buried and rose again, and then now you have to come face to face with the reality of who Jesus is. Have you been born again? When I sing those songs as we were singing today, I think back when I was born again. And, and when my heart was touched and changed, have you had that experience yet? Maybe today. Today, I said to the Lord this past week, Lord, I pray a lot for people to get saved through the years. Would you please save some people? I just want to see more people get born again. Maybe you need that today. Number five, the evidence. Verse 9 to 12. 9 to 12. Jesus says in verse 9, look at it. Which is easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? Who's he saying that to? The religious people. Now, it's not the crowd. He's looking at them, and he's asking this question. It's a good question. It's a, it's a powerful question. It's a question that is just, I just, I can't, I'm beside myself when I have read this through the years. What would be easier, your sins are forgiven, or to say, rise up and walk? What's the answer? What would be easier? Yeah, to say your sins are forgiven. Steve Matthews, your sins are forgiven. I mean, I can say that. Thank you. <laughs> I can say that. The point here is that Jesus is going to do the harder, the more impossible, to prove that he can say to this paralyzed man, 
your sins are forgiven. It's easier to say your sins are forgiven. In the mind of the scribe and Pharisee and Sadducee sitting in that room, they knew that this man would never walk again. So Jesus says, all right, so that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth and authority to forgive sins. He looks over at the guy that's paralyzed. He says, get up. And the man rises. What do you think is going through the mind of the Pharisees and the scribes? Think about that. Incredible. So that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. It says they were amazed and they glorified God. I don't think the scribes were glorifying God. I don't think it was the Pharisees that were. It was the others. It was the four. It was the paralyzed man. Some of those onlookers that were crushed into this crowd, into this house, were just in awe. And there's this eruption that happens and cheering and, and hallelujah and can't believe this and this is incredible and we could have had a sixth E, maybe put eruption, right? For the outline. They erupted into this exuberant adoration and praise. What does this look like for us? I'm going to close. Our Christian life will only go as far or to the extent that we're willing to do whatever God calls us to do. God's going to call you to go from a pew to a place like a rooftop. You're going to have to camp there for a while. You're going to have to experience all that he has. It may be unconventional. It's unconventional for them to be on that roof. And some of your family is going to look at you like you're strange. Like, what are they up to? And why are they getting to become this Jesus freak? And what, I don't understand why they're putting so much effort into this. And why to such an extent are they trying to live the Christian life? And people are going to look at you that are close to you, and they're going to go, I don't get that. Like those in the crowd. But I don't see anybody else in that crowd that brought anybody else to be saved or healed. So they're going to miss out, and some people in your world are going to miss out, but you keep going. You keep going. Live on that rooftop. Get all that God has for you there. It's going to be that important, that vital. I wanted to close the message today with uh, more of a cinematic view of what happened here. And so I'm going to show you a video. And I want you to go inside of the video as we've gone inside of the text and watch as the paralytic is healed by Jesus. So take your eyes to the screen. 